Got to love the lead in music. Uh, I'm, I'm Keith Dreyer, as Chris said. Uh, I'm going to let Kathy introduce, because uh, she's been deeply involved with this process over the last several months. Uh, I'm going to let her introduce this session and talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to do. Great. Thank you, Keith. I, I don't think I've ever taken a stage to music like that. Um, <laughs> So welcome to the penultimate session here of the World Medical Innovation Forum 2018. This is the Disruptive Dozen. And what we're going to highlight today are 12 technologies that were deemed to be transformative or disruptive uh, based on uh, experts, uh, our expert faculty opinions here. And the 12 topics were selected through a, a, quite a rigorous process where it began with departmental chairs nominating their faculty who are doing work in this area. And then more than 50 uh, experts were interviewed and asked what they thought would be a, a disruptive idea or technology in their specific area of expertise. These uh, were then reported to a review panel and the review panel then uh, assessed all 50 of these and then chose the top 12 and ranked them. And these are the top 12 disruptive technologies that you'll be hearing about today. I would like to thank the review panel, and it was chaired by Dr. Zan Kubansky and Greg Meyer. Um, and I would also like to give a special thank you to Nicole Davis, who is sitting there. Her job was uh, monumental in interviewing the faculty. Uh, probably scheduling the interviews was a task in and of itself. But she interviewed these faculty and then provided the review panel with very detailed descriptions of each of these topics so we could then assess them. So, so thank you to them. The way the session will proceed here is as follows. We will see a video of each uh, topic, and then either Keith or I will ask questions of our expert panelists, and then we'll see the next video, ask questions, and so on. And we're going to start with number 12 all the way down to number one. So here we go. Let's go to the video, please, for uh, number 12. Number 12, melding mind and machine. With some high-tech gadgetry, scientists are melding the human mind with machines computers and algorithms that can eavesdrop on the brain's signals and then translate the information into actions, like typing words on a digital keyboard or moving a robotic arm. Such brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, have been the stuff of sci-fi flicks for decades, but now they are rapidly evolving into real-world devices propelled by artificial intelligence that can rapidly decode and anticipate the brain's complex, dynamic activity. The technology, while still in its infancy, holds remarkable promise for patients suffering from a range of devastating neurological diseases or injuries. That means people with paralysis could regain the power of movement, and people with conditions such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, or locked-in syndrome could communicate meaningfully with loved ones. Researchers are already taking some tangible steps toward these goals. For example, in a recent study from a team in Pennsylvania, researchers helped a man with paralysis partially regain the sense of touch, a critical sensation that underpins many types of movement. Using microelectrodes implanted in a region of the man's brain that processes the sensation of touch, together with a robotic arm equipped with sensors on the fingertips, the researchers were able to make him feel as if his own hand was being touched. This notable advance, providing the sense of touch through a prosthetic device, builds upon this group's and other teams' earlier work on BCIs that enabled people with paralysis to control the movement and dexterity of a robotic arm using signals from their own brains. While still experimental, these and other BCIs are ushering in a new era of AI-based neurotechnologies that promise to restore the power of mobility and communication to hundreds of thousands of people with debilitating neurological conditions. And representing this topic is Lee Hochberg. Uh, Lee, what are some of the short-term or even long-term examples of uh, what shows the promise of this kind of technology? So the really straightforward short-term opportunity for brain-computer interfaces is in the realm of communication. When we see a patient who's been diagnosed with ALS, these BCIs should be able to provide us with the opportunity to say, you will never lose the ability to communicate. 
We want to be able to say that clearly without hesitating. And similarly for people with brainstem stroke, if I'm in the neuro ICU on a Monday and I see somebody who's suddenly lost the ability to move and has lost the ability to speak, we want to restore that ability to communicate by Tuesday. And by using a brain-computer interface and AI, we can decode the neural activities associated with the intended movement of one's hand. And we should be allow, able to allow that person to communicate the same way as many people in this room have communicated at least five times over the course of the morning using a ubiquitous communication technology, their own tablet computer, their own phone, their own laptop. So that's in the realm of communication. Probably the next step is being able to restore mobility. So for somebody who has lost the ability to move their arms or their legs, there's an example of a woman who's used a brain-computer interface. She had a stroke 14 years earlier, and she was just thinking about the movement of her own hand. She was able to reach out, pick up a thermos using this robotic arm through her own intention to move her own hand, and pick up and uh, take a sip of a cinnamon latte, again, for the first time, solely of her own volition in about 14 years. And similarly, for somebody with a cervical spinal cord injury who really just recently had an implanted brain-computer interface connected to some electrodes that were implanted in muscles in his arm, reached out, used a fork to pick up some mashed potatoes. Restoring mobility, similarly restoring communication, these same incredible technologies will help us in closed-loop neuromodulation devices, understanding the brain and helping people with mental health disorders as well. Thanks, Lee. Let's go to uh, number 11. Number 11, Next Gen Radiology. The digital acquisition of radiological images has had wide-reaching effects in medicine. Now, with the rise of computer vision and other artificial intelligence-based approaches, it is possible for computers to scrutinize these images for subtle variations and textures that human eyes cannot discern. That means automated methods of reading and interpreting CT scans, MRIs, and X-rays are within reach, giving radiologists new tools to systematically quantify image features and use them to help understand disease biology and predict outcomes. Cancer researchers are actively evaluating the application of AI and quantitative imaging to predict a tumor's pathogenicity, genetic makeup, or treatment response. As just one example, prostate cancer is among the most common cancers and a leading cause of cancer-related death in men in the United States. However, accurately diagnosing the disease remains a significant challenge, one brought into stark relief by the risks patients face from both under- and over-treatment. What if it were possible to predict the aggressiveness of a prostate tumor directly from a radiological image rather than a biopsy? That could mean faster, more accurate prognosis for patients as well as a better quality of life, as biopsies of the prostate gland are not only painful, but also increase infection risk. Researchers across the world are now leveraging AI-based methods in pursuit of this goal. For example, Groups in the U.S. and China are working to create automated tools that can improve the diagnosis of prostate cancer. By analyzing patients' MRIs, these tools seek to help doctors better distinguish malignant and benign forms of the disease and pinpoint highly aggressive subtypes. These efforts, when combined with other modalities for disease diagnosis and prediction, promise to improve the precision of prostate cancer treatment. Representing this topic is Alexandra Golby. Uh, Alex, you're in the departments of neurosurgery and in radiology, and you've used imaging extensively in the care of your patients. I'd um, love to hear your, your opinions on how these applications that bridge the diagnostic and interventional will, will improve what you're doing. What are some of the opportunities, and really, what are some of the challenges as you see it? So um, I think the um, challenge is to uh, bridge different techniques at different scales and also with different teams. So one idea is to get in information from non-invasive methods, which we have come to rely on doing via invasive sampling with biopsies and then pathologic investigation. So what we want to do is bring together the diagnostic imaging team and methods with the surg surgeon or interventional radiologist team and methods and approaches, and then the pathologists' um, team
team and approaches. So uh, the coming together of the different teams and aligning goals is a big challenge. And then um, the registration, uh, spatial and, um, and temporal, and also across different scales is going to be very important. Because if we want the imaging to give us information that we presently get from tissue samples, then we're going to have to be able to achieve a very close registration so that the ground truth for any given vi uh, voxel or pixel is known. And that, I think that's a very big challenge. Um, now, with these challenges comes, of course, the opportunity, I think, to massively impact care. So um, you heard about prostate cancer and the need for, uh, to try to accurately predict who's going to have aggressive disease and not. Also, the need to target uh, the most aggressive part of the tumor. Um, and these are true for lots of cancers. So in my practice, treating patients with brain tumors, um, we uh, very much have a challenge in trying to assess the efficacy of treatment that we're giving patients. And that's sometimes known as pseudoprogression, where patient scans look worse, but they're not actually getting worse. And that is a very important question because it entirely determines what, what treatment they should be on. And if the challenge is um, to do that without having them do another brain surgery, um, then that's a very worthy goal and a very important goal. Thank you, Alex. Next video, please. Number 10, disseminating medical expertise to areas that need it most. Replacing physicians has been cited as an aim of artificial intelligence-based approaches to healthcare. Yet beyond the hype and hyperbole, there is a much more likely and worthy application, infusing clinical expertise into regions where doctors are in short supply. A key case in point, the global shortage of radiologists. The problem is particularly pronounced in low resource settings, yet wealthier nations are not immune to these challenges. Artificial intelligence can help fill this gap. Researchers are working on multiple fronts to develop AI-based applications for a range of important health conditions, like TB, which is among the top 10 causes of death worldwide. Chest X-rays are an important part of TB diagnosis. While not sufficient to definitively diagnose the disease, they provide a cheap, rapid, and effective way of screening the lungs for TB-related abnormalities, particularly in areas where the disease is prevalent. Some progress has been made in improving global access to X-ray machines, but many regions are still plagued by a lack of expertise in diagnostic radiology. That means patients often fail to get even the most basic screening tests, delaying TB diagnosis and treatment. Now, various research teams, including ones in Texas and Pennsylvania, are harnessing deep learning methods to create automated tools for TB detection on chest X-rays. The accuracy of these models is quite high, approaching and in some cases, even matching the performance of clinical experts. These efforts suggest that by harnessing AI, it will soon become feasible to extend the reach of radiologists to places that currently lack care providers. And uh, re representing this topic is Jay Shree Kilpathy Kramer. Uh, Jay Shree, what are the challenges? I know you know you're very passionate about providing this technology to the underserved populations. What are the challenges, not just technical, but also policy, environmental, all the other issues as well? So as was mentioned before, the potential for this technology to increase access to healthcare is tremendous. There's a number of challenges uh, in terms of the technical challenges, for instance, for a lot of these data, uh, algorithms, we need a lot of well-curated data sets. Mm. We need data that's been collected and a diversity of data sets. For instance, the course of the disease or the presentation of the disease in a population in India might look very different than the similar disease in the US. Uh, I work in a disease in an area called retinopathy of prematurity, and the eyes of the babies with this disease look a little different for the algorithms that are trained, uh, for the data sets that are collected here compared mm. to the data that's collected in India. Similarly, the progress, the course of the disease is also quite different. So I think it's, as we're developing these algorithms, it's really important to make sure that the data set represents a diversity of presentation, of populations, of, uh, we can't just develop an algorithm based on a single population and expect it to work as well on other populations. Uh, in terms of technical and other aspects, so a lot of these algorithms require 
potentially the ability to upload to the cloud, for instance, not mm -hmm. all areas might have access to the cloud. Uh, a way around that is making the acquisition machine smarter. So for instance, instead of, of, of taking the acquired image and then sending it up to the cloud and asking for a response back, if you could embed some of that intelligence in the camera such that anyone can take an, a good quality image and the person taking the image would be alerted that it's a poor quality but, or there's motion, things like that. If the camera could tell the person taking the image that this, this image needs to be retaken and have, make that available back immediately, then uh, th that, uh, again, gets around the issue of necessarily needing an extremely good Wi-Fi network and things like that. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to the next video. Number nine. Getting back to FaceTime, AI tools that help reduce physicians' computer use. Recent estimates indicate for each hour of face-to-face -face interaction with patients, physicians log almost two hours on administrative computer tasks, such as completing required documentation in electronic health records. This abundance of computer work is taking a toll. A 2016 survey of more than 6,000 U.S. doctors revealed that the vast majority use EHRs and that this group was frustrated with how much time they spend on the computer. The survey also reported that these physicians were more prone to professional burnout. Several research teams and organizations are now turning to artificial intelligence and machine learning to help lighten physicians' computer workload by automating tasks they now perform by hand. If Netflix can choose the next television series you'll want to binge watch, why can't AI anticipate the information doctors need to submit digitally? For example, a team in California is now working to create AI-based tools that will help physicians reclaim valuable time with their patients and improve professional satisfaction. Their approach involves scanning patient records for relevant medical information, proposing a likely diagnosis, and creating the necessary documentation for downstream services, including billing. The team likens their AI system to a digital co-pilot that mimics how physicians make decisions and takes on the most mundane administrative tasks. The ultimate goal of these and other AI-based efforts focused on clinical documentation is to relieve doctors of repetitive and time-consuming computer work, which is ideally suited for machines anyway and allow them more time for doing what they do best, caring for patients. Representing this topic is Adam Landman. Um, Adam, over the course of the past three days, we've been seeing a lot of uh, front-end facing AI tools. What are some of the less visible applications that you can envision that may help physicians and other healthcare providers to do their work more efficiently? Thanks so much. Um, you know, the EHR was originally designed largely with um, billing, compliance, and regulatory requirements in mind. And it was really exciting to hear Seema Verma today talk about how CMS is considering and investigating changing the Medicare payment policies. This really creates an opportunity for us to uh, rethink the EHR and make it more patient-focused and help improve the clinician experience. A recent, a recent study looked at EHR logs and looked at where clinicians were spending the majority of their time, and maybe not surprisingly, they identified clinical documentation, order entry, and in-basket as three of those areas. So we want to share some thoughts in those three areas. Clinical documentation, you can type notes. Uh, many organizations are using um, voice recognition and scribes, and we heard a little bit about that in the last panel. I think we may need to be even more bold and consider changes like video recording a clinical encounter, almost like police wear body cams um, or car cams, and then use AI and machine learning techniques to index, uh, index those videos for future information retrieval. Um, on order entry, order entry remains an important task to be performed by a clinician because in the workflow we often ins insert clinical decision support. But just like in the home where we're using virtual assistants like Siri and Alexa, the future will bring virtual assistants to the bedside for clinicians to use with embedded intelligence. And that's happening now with companies like Microsoft, Google, and Nuance. And finally, um, for InBasket, unfortunately, that remains a time-consuming and challenging task for many clinicians. So AI really has the opportunity to completely take over some of the mundane tasks like medication refills and results notifications, but also has the opportunity to prioritize and bring to the top of the InBasket the tasks that clinicians really need to focus on. 
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, next video, please. Number eight, minimizing the threats of antimicrobial resistance and infections associated with antibiotic use. The introduction of effective antibiotics in the 1940s ushered in an era of optimism with rapid declines in deaths due to infections. Since that time, however, antibiotic resistance has emerged rapidly and too few antibiotics are making it through the development pipeline. That means once curable infections could soon become more virulent and even untreatable. The decline in the usefulness of antibiotics is troubling on multiple fronts. But perhaps one of the most serious is the accompanying rise in infections with multi-drug resistant organisms, particularly in hospitals and other healthcare settings. The danger lies not just in the superbugs themselves, but also in another infection linked to antibiotic use, Clostridium difficile colitis, which causes life-threatening diarrhea, primarily in those recently treated with antibiotics. C. difficile represents the leading cause of healthcare-associated infection in the U.S. In 2011, nearly half a million Americans became infected with C. difficile, and roughly 30,000 patients died within a month of diagnosis. Researchers are now working to combat this formidable health threat by leveraging machine learning and other artificial intelligence approaches. For example, researchers in Massachusetts and Michigan are developing a tool that uses clinical data from patients' electronic health records to create an AI-based risk score that reflects a patient's likelihood of developing a C. difficile infection. The score incorporates diverse types of data, such as medications, procedures, healthcare settings, and staff lab results, vital signs, and more. It can also help create daily estimates of C. difficile infection risk for each patient, predictions that can then be used to develop targeted interventions that help minimize the threat of this formidable superbug. These and other AI-based innovations are helping clinicians better tailor treatment according to the needs of individual patients. And that kind of precision is essential to preserving the long-term success of our precious antibiotic arsenal. Representing this topic is Erica Shinoy. Uh, Erica, can these AI-based tools live up to their, that enormous expectation? Well, I think uh, they can, and if they don't, it's really a failure on all of our, uh, our plates. So for the hospitals that are sitting on mountains of electronic health record data and are not using them to their fullest potential, to industry that's not using this to build, to create smarter, faster clinical trial design, and for EHRs that are obviously creating these data not to use them would be a failure. So I think there's enormous potential. Whether or not we get to that potential is a different story. The second piece is that they need to think about EHRs not just as one institution because the bugs come go between institutions. They don't know that they're at Hospital A or Hospital B or Nursing Home C. They come with us, and whether we know about it or not as clinicians, that affects the ability to deliver really good care. So as the EHR moves from acute care settings, which are pretty well um, um, versed in EHRs, but to nursing homes and other settings, the real excitement could be in linking all these together. Thank you, Eric. Let's queue up the next video. Number seven, harnessing the power of digital pathology. The ability to digitize pathology slides in a clinical setting recently became possible in the U.S. with the first whole slide imaging system for digital pathology approved by the FDA in April 2017. Now, researchers in academia and biopharma are beginning to harness these new capabilities, ushering in a new era in digital pathology. For example, teams in the US, Ireland, and the Netherlands are creating automated machine learning-based methods to detect cancer cells on a digital pathology slide. Although the tools are not yet available for routine clinical use, the goal is to give pathologists smarter, less time-consuming, and more precise methods to determine which patients have cancer and which patients don't, and to help pinpoint the most effective treatments. Initial work is aimed at detecting a handful of cancer types, including breast, prostate, lung, and colorectal cancers. Investigators are also working to extend the power of digital pathology to disease prognosis. Tumors are generally classified according to grade and stage, reflecting the irregularity of the cell's appearance and how far they have spread within the body. 
but this system is known to be imperfect. Within a single stage or grade of tumor, there can be wide variability in patient survival. Researchers in California have designed an automated method that can scrutinize tumor cells for a wide array of cancer-specific traits, including those that cannot be discerned by the human eye. It accurately predicted survival in lung cancer patients diagnosed with stage one adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. Through these and other examples, we are glimpsing a new generation of AI-based, data-driven tools in pathology that can help clinicians tame complexity and make more precise diagnoses and outcome predictions for their patients. Representing this topic is Jeff Golden, and radiology has gone through this process, but uh, Jeff, what excites you the most about the digitization of pathology, and what do you think it will mean for research as well as for clinical care? Great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna restrict my uh, comments to really two areas, and that is value and efficiency. The value is around what pathology delivers. 70% of all decisions in healthcare are based on a pathology result. Somewhere around 70 to 75% of all data in the electronic health record are from a pathology result. And so the more accurate we do it, the sooner we get to the right diagnosis, the better we're going to be. And that's what digital pathology and AI has the opportunity of delivering for anatomic pathology, where it is historically, from the time of Virchow, really based on looking at the slide and assessing what the grade of that tumor is, making sometimes subjective decisions about that. Today, with um, the um, implementation of different algorithms, we are now a getting to the point where we can actually do a better job of assessing whether a cancer is going to progress rapidly or slowly and thus change how patients are gonna be treated based on the um, algorithm rather than clinical staging or the histopathologic grade. And that's gonna be a huge advance. So that's the value part of it. The efficiency is that you're going to, the pathologist is um, increasingly being asked to do more work like most people in healthcare. And the AI systems today are being developed to be able to screen through slides and be able to point us, to direct us at the right thing to look at so that we can assess what's important and what's not for helping make decisions for those patients and increasing the efficiency of the use of the pathologist for the time they spend with each case. Thank you, Thank you Jeff. Can we have the next video, please? Number six, bringing smart machines to medicine. Self-driving cars are poised to disrupt the transportation industry, and there is a similar revolution underway in healthcare. This effort seeks to engineer a new generation of smart medical equipment that melds scanning with interpretation, monitoring with treatment, and merges data from disparate devices into a common, readily interpretable stream. A key frontier for designing and deploying such intelligent systems is the Intensive Care Unit, ICU, where clinicians treat patients with complicated, life-threatening conditions. The departments are filled with an array of life-saving equipment, including monitors, pumps, ventilators, and drug infusers. Typically, these devices do not talk to each other. In addition, they churn out data at an impressive rate, producing thousands of data points a day for just one patient. Teams across the country are harnessing artificial intelligence to create new tools that enhance patient monitoring in ICUs and reduce information overload for clinicians. For example, researchers in states like California, Massachusetts, and Minnesota are developing systems that harmonize, integrate, and display patient data from diverse types of clinical sensors, forming a kind of digital dashboard that can be viewed at the bedside of ICU patients. Other groups, including one in New Jersey, are using machine learning to make individual devices smarter, like ventilators that can sense when their pacing is off, or when complications such as pneumonia are brewing, and pumps that can monitor how much fluid has been infused into a patient and whether the flow rate needs to be changed. With the rise of such smart systems comes the capacity for enhanced prediction, such as signaling a life-threatening event, like an abnormal heart rhythm before it happens. For critically ill patients, that advance warning could be vital. 
And representing this topic is uh, Mark Michalski. Mark, you've been, I know, uh, involved in the design and development of various smart machines in healthcare. What intrigues you about this space? Well, I think um, what's so exciting about this is um, by inserting intelligence within the machines themselves, you have the opportunity to make impacts where humans can't or when it's impractical for humans to, to make impacts. Um, so, for example, uh, we, we heard a little bit about uh, taking uh, disparate bits of data across the healthcare system, integrating it, and uh, coming up with a result, say an alert early on, which would, uh, which would alert an interventionalist to, or uh, ICU doctor, uh, intensivist, to, uh, um, to intervene early on. An aggregation of that data is not something that a human can do. Uh, in the imaging world, um, uh, there's raw data that comes off the scanner, and there are biomarkers potentially in that raw data that we may not be able to see. Um, there's also the opportunity of um, uh, inserting intelligence where humans, it just is not practical for them to be there. So, for example, Jay Cherie uh, mentioned one of those instances, um, you know, where uh, maybe there's not a, uh, a, um, a professional um, uh, sonographer or something like that for uh, the identification of abnormalities in ultrasound is another place. So um, the potential of smart de de uh, devices is really um, being able to do things that humans can't do today because it's just hard to integrate all that data rapidly enough and uh, the ability to um, um, take humans out of the equation when, um, when there's not one uh, available. Thanks, Mark. Let's go to the next video. Number five, reading the tea leaves of cancer immunotherapy. The immune system protects the body from a host of foreign invaders. Over the last few years, therapies that leverage these defenses to fight cancer, so-called cancer immunotherapies, have yielded impressive outcomes in combating some forms of the disease. Yet, as promising as these therapies are, they currently help only a small subset of patients. The majority of patients do not respond. This picture is further muddied by the treatment's risk of severe side effects and high cost. And yet, there are currently no reliable biomarkers that can help physicians identify patients for whom immunotherapies will be most effective. To lend greater clarity to the clinical use of cancer immunotherapies, researchers across the world are working on multiple fronts to uncover cellular and molecular signals that can help differentiate the responders from the non-responders. For example, a team in Boston is searching for molecular patterns in tumor samples to uncover predictive biomarkers. Their work makes use of multidimensional methods that scan for scores of different proteins found within tumor cells as well as neighboring cells. Given the high complexity of these data, the researchers are harnessing sophisticated machine learning algorithms to help propel their analyses and pinpoint molecular patterns in patients' tumors that may signal whether a specific type of immunotherapy is likely to be effective. The ultimate goal is to develop a kind of scoring system that can help stratify patients according to their likelihood of responding to this powerful new class of cancer drugs. And representing this topic is Long Lee. Long, what are some of the current stumbling blocks to uh, tr truly achieving personalized treatments for cancer? Yeah, so with regards to immunotherapy, uh, it's really a broad uh, topic and area. There are various different uh, modalities in terms of cancer immunotherapy, whether you talk about CAR T cells, cancer vaccines, immunomodulators, or um, checkpoint inhibitors. So recently in the past few years, the most exciting development in the cancer world has been checkpoint immuno um, blockers uh, because those have seen durable response. But unfortunately, there's only a subset of patients that actually respond. And one of the main reasons why is that we still don't understand all of the disease biology. Uh, this is a very complex problem, unlike probably other things that we deal with in pathology and radiology, where it is truly a multifaceted problem. There's the host uh, immune factor in terms of HLA, um, host uh, immune cells, 
the cancer cells themselves, as well as the tumor microenvironment. So all these factors complicate the picture. So how do we get across um, a sort of method to actually predict response to this therapy? I think going forward, we definitely need more patient data. Up to now, the therapies have been relatively new, so not many cancer patients have actually been put on the drug. So whether we need to integrate this across one institution, across multiple institutions, is going to be a key factor in terms of augmenting the patient population to drive the model and the AI process. In addition, we don't have enough data at the individual patient level. Right now, we're merely looking at pd one staining, IC, the histology, um, cancer type, cancer staging, and just recently, we've added on microsite instability testing as well as uh, tumor mutation burden. But so far, any one of those alone or even in combination are still not predictive. Most studies only show about 15 to 40 percent of these patients respond. So going forward, I think we really need a bevy, a very heavy uh, load of data, many patients across multiple institutions to actually drive the modeling to be able to create a predictive model uh, to actually show who will respond or not to these uh, cancer immunotherapies. Thank you, Long. A lot of work yet to be done. So the next video, please. Number four, risky business, using EHRs to predict disease risk. With the rise of electronic health record systems over the last decade, the vast majority of U.S. hospitals now capture patients' medical information in a digital format to help streamline and improve the business aspects of healthcare, decreasing cost, increasing efficiency, and improving the quality and safety of care. These digital EHRs are enabling a new wave of biomedical and clinical research, generating new knowledge to improve clinical decision-making and helping to make healthcare more precise. Given the wealth of data contained in EHRs, researchers are turning to artificial intelligence, including a promising branch of machine learning known as deep learning to more effectively harness these big data. Using deep learning methods, a team of New York researchers recently developed a method for predicting patients' future health. The team trained it using roughly 700,000 individual patient records. They engineered their tool to forecast not just one type of illness, but nearly 80 different conditions, including cancers, heart disease, diabetes, and psychiatric disease. In initial tests, the tool's performance proved remarkable, particularly for forecasting severe forms of diabetes, certain types of cancer, and schizophrenia, a condition that is often vexing for clinicians to predict. While there is significant enthusiasm around these and other deep learning techniques, there is also some concern. Deep learning algorithms often operate much like a black box. They yield answers, but it is difficult to determine exactly how those answers were generated. Research teams across the world are now working on ways to enable more transparent AI-based systems. And representing this topic is Ziad Obermeyer. Uh, Ziad, you look at EHRs today, the tremendous amount of information that they gather is kind of good and bad news. From your perspective, what is the good and the bad here? Well, I, I won't be the first to observe that data uh, is the new oil. And in fact, data is better than oil. It's cleaner, it's renewable, it's available in lots of different places. It does have one thing in common with oil, though, which is that it doesn't come right out of the ground. Um, it actually requires some work to get it out of the ground. And, um, and I think that's, that's the problem. If you look back, the, the original term um, for this work in the literature is data mining. And mining is, um, you know, I've never been in a mine, uh, but, but I, I work in a data mine, and it's, uh, that's hard work. Um, and, and part of the hard work is integrating all of the data together in one place. And it's been really wonderful to talk to so many people in the audience about how they're trying to do that in their health systems and, and how we might be able to help. But there's another problem that's, I think, even more difficult to deal with, which is understanding what it is you're getting when you're predicting a disease in an EHR. So often you, you'll hear that an algorithm can predict depression or stroke. But when you scratch the surface, what you find is that what they're predicting is actually a billing code for stroke. And that's actually very different from stroke. And you might say, OK, well, we're just going to use the MRI results. But then you have to ask, and who can afford the MRI and who can't? And so what you end up predicting is very different from what you think you're predicting. You might be predicting billing for a stroke in people who can pay for a diagnostic rather than some sort of cerebral ischemia. 
And in the rest of the deep learning world, when you're trying to detect cats in YouTube videos, um, we can all agree what a, what a cat is, but we can't all agree on what a stroke or, or, or a sepsis or, um, or many of these fundamentally uncertain medical concepts are. And so I think that's going forward. The biggest challenge for this area is making sure we understand exactly what we're predicting, even before we start opening up the black box and figuring out how we're predicting it, is what are we actually predicting with these models? Excellent. Thank you, Ziad. Let's queue up the next video. Number three, can personal devices improve your health? For most of our waking hours, we sport smartwatches strapped to our wrists or smartphones tucked into our pockets. We rely on these mini computers for an ever expanding array of tasks. But can these digital companions make us healthier? Can they warn of an impending heart attack? or predict the early stages of Alzheimer's disease? That's precisely the goal of a new wave of research that seeks to harness the vast amounts of data that are collected passively throughout the day by personal devices, such as Fitbits, Apple Watches, and smartphones. For example, how often does an individual stand up and move around? How far does she typically walk, and for how long? What is her gait like? How often does she leave the house or make phone calls? How frequently does she send text messages? How fast does she type? To sort through the big data that flow from these devices, researchers are turning to different forms of artificial intelligence to create a kind of digital phenotype that could help monitor patients' health over time. For example, a team in Boston is leveraging this approach to study patients who have recently undergone treatment for brain cancer. In many forms of the disease, the standard of care post-treatment is fairly straightforward. Patients receive an MRI scan every few months to check for complications or reoccurrence. The Boston researchers are now looking for ways to stratify these patients, using digital phenotyping, for example, to help pinpoint those who require more aggressive interventions. They and others believe that data from smartphones and other personal devices will soon become another tool in clinicians' toolbox to help identify acute changes in patient behavior that indicate a decline in health. And representing this topic is Omar Arnout. Uh, and, and, and obviously, the benefit from these technologies is contingent upon patients adopting them. So Omar, I, I wanted to ask, do you think patients will accept these technologies, or will they see them as another invasion of their privacy? Thanks, Kathy. So I think it's, um, in general, as a society, we've been pretty liberal with our digital data and who we share it with. Uh, as things come into our collective consciousness, like the Cambridge Analytica issues and, and the Facebook uh, issues, I think people will become more and more uh, prudent about who they share what kinds of data with. Uh, as far as patients are concerned, we recruit um, quite a few patients to the Digital Phenotyping Project. And I can tell you, at least from our experience, we've had a, a very good uptick in, in people signing up. And I think there's a few reasons for that. Number one, uh, People, even if these things are not going to help them personally, I feel like uh, are likely to sign up for something that might help people in their position down the line. And I think there's a little bit more inherent trust between uh, patients and their physicians and even their researchers than there is with some of these big companies like, like Facebook. Um, and another part of that uh, is also what is the likelihood that these things are going to help our patients? And I think. Uh, there really is a very good chance because our care is so episodic and the data we collect right now is very coarse. Things like can they walk into our clinic, can they move everything symmetrically. Uh, and I think by collecting very granular data from these devices in a continuous fashion, there's a very good potential that they're going to help us take better care of them. Great. Thank you. The next video, please. Number two. A picture is worth a thousand words. In medicine, an image on a computer screen is more than just a picture. It is millions, even billions of data points that can be systematically mined for connections to health and disease. Understanding how these data points vary within and between images and patients stretches the limits of human cognition. Now, artificial intelligence is transforming how these digital images are analyzed and interpreted. With advances in computer vision and machine learning, a new era of automated disease detection is dawning, providing clinicians with tools to more rapidly, and in some cases, more accurately diagnose, characterize, and predict the course of disease. 
This revolution is also expanding to include an increasingly important source of clinical images, smartphones. Researchers in California recently developed an algorithm to detect skin cancer that analyzes photographs of moles and other skin lesions, including photos taken with smartphones. The team's software was able to distinguish benign from malignant skin cancers, including melanomas. Importantly, its diagnostic accuracy was comparable to that of more than 20 board-certified dermatologists. If deployed widely on mobile devices, this skin cancer detection method could help expand access to diagnostic expertise in dermatology. For melanoma, the deadliest form of skin cancer, early diagnosis is crucial. If caught early, the five-year survival rate is over 99%. Yet that figure plunges to around 14% if the disease goes undiagnosed until its most advanced stages. With this effort and many others, researchers are leveraging AI and smartphone photos for a variety of medical purposes, including preventative care, monitoring of chronic disease, and providing expert care to underserved areas. And representing this topic is uh, Hadi Shafi. Hadi, you've been involved in, uh, in development of a number of smartphone applications, some administered by patients themselves. What are the uh, current examples or near-term examples that you see that are out there uh, that uh, can illustrate some of the promises of this technology? Yeah, so to understand the promise of the cell phone technology, I think it, we really need to understand what is actually happening in cell phone industry. We have reached over 50% cell phone penetration around the globe, and it's going to reach more than 65% uh, by 2022. And uh, so we, we have mo a majority of our population is basically equipped with these pocket size, powerful devices that are equipped with a bunch of different uh, sensors built in inside it. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for us. And then uh, particularly on artificial intelligence, almost every single major player in cell phone industry has started building um, AI software and basically the hardware into their devices, which has basically started since 2017. And that's not a coincidence, I think. There is a reason behind this. Every day in our digital world, basically we generate more than 2.5 million terabytes of data. So in cell phone uh, industry, the manufacturers believe that they can utilize this amount of data using artificial intelligence in order to provide much more uh, uh, personalized uh, and faster and basically smarter services to the clients and expand their business. Okay, so my point is that outside of healthcare, there is something big happening. There is uh, this technology advancement moving forward in AI cell phone technology, and we can actually leverage that opportunity to address some of the important problems we have in disease management at the point of care. Thank you, Hadi. And let's go to the number one disruptor. Number one, artificial intelligence at the bedside. As medicine has grown in complexity, the amount of data a single patient can generate, even during a brief hospital stay, has skyrocketed. This big data challenge is reflected in the diversity of clinical measurements that can be made at patients' bedsides, such as blood pressure readings, electrocardiograms, and electroencephalograms. For critically ill patients, these routine readings can quickly swell into vast oceans of data, complicating physicians' efforts to make timely, sound decisions. Consider electroencephalograms, or EEGs. Neurologists now examine this data by eye, searching for changes in the size, shape, and frequency of the waveforms. Yet due to the massive volume of information contained in EEGs, it is feasible for doctors to review recordings from ICU patients only twice a day, searching for specific signatures that can forecast a seizure or other signs of neurological illness. But what if EEG data could be mined continuously in an automated fashion to help predict patient outcomes? Researchers are working toward this goal by harnessing artificial intelligence. Using machine learning, a team in Boston has developed an algorithm to help address an important and vexing problem, deciding whether or not to withdraw care from comatose patients. These patients represent a deeply challenging group, and the tools for evaluating their condition generally lack precision. 
the Boston researchers developed a method to automatically quantify patients' brain activity in response to external stimuli using EEG. The team is now honing and improving this tool so that it can assign a probability score that accurately reflects a patient's likelihood of recovery in six months. Through examples like this, researchers are using AI to swiftly sort through high-volume physiological data, revealing hidden connections and patterns that can help clinicians improve patient care. And representing the top topic here is Brandon Westover. Um, and Brandon, you've been involved in developing uh, AI-based tools to help make sense of big healthcare data. What are some of the areas of medicine that you think are most ripe for these applications? Thanks. Um, so I, I, brain monitoring uh, uh, for many different purposes is, is a ripe area. So the, the cardiac arrest, um, coma, you know, predict, predicting whether patients can wake up from coma and, and therefore whether or not it's, you know, it would be in their, their best interest to withdraw care is, is one example. And it maybe illustrates three ways in which uh, AI is kind of helping us deal with this continuously in-streaming data. So one way is helps us detect things that we, you know, when we're asleep, you know, when we're not able to look at it uh, in, much faster. Um, so one, one example, in fact, in, in these patients uh, with coma after cardiac arrest, they're, they have seizures. And, and those seizures we usually need to treat, but you know, often they happen while we're asleep and uh, we don't know until the morning, which is kind of, you know, that's bad. Um, a second way that, that AI can help us is, um, in under appreciating trends that, that are kind of very, very slowly evolving. Um, so, so sometimes looking at this data to see is, is someone recovering, you know, I'm looking at 10 seconds at a time and, but I, you know, I want to see if it's changed from 24 hours ago. That's like looking at your, trying to see if your hair is growing longer, which for me is relatively easy, but for, you know, it's not always so easy. Um, and it's pretty easy for, to get an AI algorithm if you have lots and lots of patients worth of data and, and the outcomes recorded to appreciate those kinds of patterns and therefore, you know, maybe detect subtle changes of improvement and, and then forestall withdrawing care inappropriately. Um, and then the third, the third, uh, way that AI is helping deal with this massive amount of data uh, streaming in about patients' brains is just, again, appreciating what it means. So um, the, this, in this example of cardiac arrest again, you know, again, what, can the patient recover? Uh, th that you know, sometimes, uh, actually the reason we got interested, and this is work from my group, there, there, there's a lot of variability in how familiar people are with the literature on this and the ability to interpret the patterns. And so um, you know, we, it's, it's really nice to be able to have an algorithm that has access to everyone's data who's come before to say no. It, this, this is not, you know, unrecoverable. Uh, give some more time, and and to be informed by, you know, by, uh, by kind of essentially all the experience of, of physicians and, uh, and and other patients' data that have come before. Thank you very much, and can we have a round of applause for our disruptors?